Welcome back to our growing experiment. We're here with Stacy and Mitch. Uh, so can you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves? So we, we're basically in New Sudbury and uh, what we do is we, we've been gardening for, I want to say three years, pretty three actively, years. Um, with the goal of, um, we aren't fully sustainable on our food source, but we are, I'd say about 50% of our produce comes from our garden now. Um, I come from a family of gardeners. My grandfather came from Massey and he was a farmer. And when he moved to Sudbury, he basically packed up his farm and brought it to Regent Street. Um, he had a garden the size of his backyard and I grew up basically playing in there. So we started doing that at home for fun. And yeah. I, uh, I grew up further up north in Sudbury and um, we had a very short growing season. Uh, my neighbor, uh, my, I'm talking when I was seven or eight years old, uh, my neighbor had a greenhouse and a pretty sizable garden. And um, I basically got started just going over and helping them out and pulling weeds. And, you know, and my reward was a basket full of carrots or a basket full of something that he had ready to go. Um, when I transitioned to adult life, uh, I had a little property in Timmins. Um, again in in the rural or uh, residential area and um, I started out there too with like little four by four garden boxes and just experimenting with different things um, not as much for sustainability or you know even saving money um, it was mostly just for fun and just to see what we could grow in there um, so when 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 we bought the house here when we got married bought the house um, it was kind of like a, hey I used to do this in Timmins we can do this here. So built a little box, um, went with kind of like, this is what I did in Timmins and it failed miserably. We ended up, um, oh, we got some stuff, but it wasn't anything to write home about. We overplanted that box. <laughs> yeah, like we're talking, we're talking <laughs> six by three. Completely overplanted that box. Yeah. We had like three cabbages in a tiny little box because we knew nothing about gardening. We just assumed it through the seeds in the ground and hoped for the best. <laughs> yeah, like, we've been there. Yeah, very naive beginning until I started like actively researching um, James Prigioni Food Forest. He's, I think I've heard of him. He is my absolute favorite go-to. He works with nature. He doesn't work against nature. And he basically uses the plants and where the plants complement each other so that it doesn't act as like so much work for us to do like the Plus, yeah. planting um planting in shade using basically using the plants to each other's benefit and i i kind of got hooked on that idea and that's where our garden started taking off was essentially learning the sustainability portion of it all yeah, that's uh, that's an idea that we really liked. We haven't done a, a great job of doing that yet. We've done some uh, some variations of kind of just standard rows and stuff like that. And we've we've tried to plant things around each other that at least uh, aren't antagonistic to each other. Yeah. Um, but we 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 like that idea. We haven't really uh, learned how to properly Im implement it yet. So, what would be like say a good example of how you're planting your stuff together where they work together? So my. The biggest thing that we started with that kind of got me hooked was the birdhouse gourds because I'd been told by three separate people that we couldn't grow them in Sudbury. So I kind of took it as a little bit of a challenge of, well, I'm going to grow them in Sudbury, whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, so I started researching them and I found out that their flowers actually bloom at night. They don't bloom during the day, but they, they require pollinators. So with learning about hand pollination and everything else, I started to figure out that the morning glory seeds, for instance, the flowers, they look exactly like the gourd flowers and they vine. So they were a perfect complement to the birdhouse gourds and any type of gourd, because what they do is they basically trellis up the, vi the vine itself and they attract the pollinators. Okay. So it's stuff like that, where you can kind of get the bees to work with you towards your plants while they're trying to attract the other plants like the flowers that pollinate and whatnot right mm -hmm. right cabbage 
there's a, is it nosternum flowers? Mm -hmm. They love, the cabbage worms love them. So they'll go to them instead of the cabbage, like stuff like that versus using chemicals in the garden. Yeah, like like you said earlier on too, it's like you learn how you work with nature and nature helps you out. Yeah. It's like uh, you can kind of work out a reciprocal relationship where, uh, you know, because because that's that's sometimes what's like intimidating about getting into gardening or especially setting a goal like trying to grow all of your food in, in the city, right? Because it's mm -hmm. like you don't want to be out there working all the time because you're probably working a full-time job and, you know, you might have kids or a family and there's only so many hours in a day. So any helping hand, and that's a, that's a hell of a helping hand to have. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing we found, so worm castings. I don't know if you guys have been playing around with the worm castings yet. No, uh, I've looked into it, but uh, we definitely haven't experimented with it. <laughs> the worm casting is like gold to the garden. Like they, like it just, it's the best. Um, so what we did was we bought two pounds of worms this year and two pounds of worms helps with a family of five. It takes care of the, like the composting. Um, we used a bin and we basically put our, our food scraps in there every, every week and it composts into the food or the worm castings. Mm -hmm. The worm castings work in the garden. What you do is you literally put it into your pail of water and it's, it's like your fertilizer and they love it. Um, uh, was it a specific species of worm you got? And then uh, what, 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 what does it take for like the care of them say? Like, do you have to sort of move them every so often or? So we use uh, red wrigglers. Okay. Uh, as for care, I just, I just set them up as per the, the worm breeders uh, instructions with um, a little bit of bedding at first and then uh, like a drainage layer almost. Um, we set us up in um, Tupperware bins, like large, uh, just Rubbermaids, um, just for the fact that we didn't want to just lose them all in the garden. And right. uh, so, some people will actually put their feeders in the garden, like in the corners or somewhere, and then they'll just go and add their food in there through a little bit of compost layer. Um, we didn't really want to do that just to kind of start off anyways, just to build up our own colony. So we put them in two big bins. Um, they're fairly easy to maintain. I, we just save our food, our food scraps, banana peels, uh, you know, just vegetable fruit trimmings. Um, so we don't even use, we don't use any fertilizers whatsoever in our yeah. garden. We just solely use the worm castings. Okay. And indoor plants too. Indoor plants love it. It's like a, it's a gold to me. So we don't, we don't have like a really perfect setup for our worms right now because it's really difficult to separate the worms from the castings uh the way we have it set up um but uh I, I think yeah like once we once we get more into it possibly this summer uh we'll try to uh either build or purchase something that will help us divide the, the worms from the castings and use that more efficiently but so far it's been working out pretty good like we still put out some the green bin in, uh, in Sudbury here yeah um but uh it's mostly you know the fatty stuff the food leftovers the meal leftovers the meat all the of meat. Yeah, whatever so you don't really want in the garden exactly. Yeah. exactly exactly so and when i plan my grocery i, I plan ahead of time to know okay well are the word do the worms need food this week and then okay well yes yeah, so, okay well so we'll buy extra vegetable stuff so we'll make extra vegetables and then we'll just keep the trimming and use the vegetables for ourselves mm -hmm. um the great thing is with the garden then all the the stuff that comes out of the garden that we don't use can go back to the worms. Yeah. 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 It's uh using one of your outputs more efficiently, right? Like instead of throwing it in a bag or putting it on the curb, it's like put it to work, then the worms are making more food for your plants, which more food for so it's a nice, it's a nice uh closed loop. Yep. And yeah. it's adapted to our land, right? Like everything is completely even the seeds, like all our seeds that we collected, it's the better seeds that are adapted to our property. For next year that we've collected from this year and yeah. like the it's important to try and get your local seeds right and your yeah. like adapted plants to your grow zone so we're excited to see what this year does now that we've got all our seeds from our own you know source kind of deal 
Yeah, and it's it's really cool too, as uh, just like a little life lesson for something as simple as gardening. You you grew seeds, like you bought some seeds. Now you have the plants, which had more seeds. And mm -hmm. forever and ever, as long as you take care of those plants property, you have every plant you'll ever need. Adapt it to your property too. And yep. that's the biggest thing because people don't realize when you're buying seeds from a commercial, you know, big box store, those seeds are not from here. Yeah, <laughs> they could exactly. be seeds that have been for Florida for all you know, right? Like they try to get as close to here, but it's important to try and get adapted to our grow zone. Yeah, the, it's that makes perfect sense. Like, of course, the plants that live in this area, they've been living here for how long and they, they thrive here, but well, they've adapted, right? Yeah. And so it makes total sense that over a period of time, you select the plants that do the best in the condition and mm -hmm. you're going to have plants that are going to thrive and healthy plants is healthy food for you. Yeah, like our birdhouse gourds from last, well, this is our third year growing birdhouse gourds now. So we're taking the best gourd basically to do our seeds for this year. Um, we've got... Yeah. How many of those? We have about 14 of them in our garage right now drying. <laughs> yeah, well, that's like, uh, so the beans that we grow originally were from her family's garden in Portugal. And oh. we harvest beans every year and we save a bunch of them and dry them up. And every year we're using originally from a similar climate, but slowly adapting to the climate here. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And then, uh, and then, like you said uh, earlier, you said you were from further north than Ontario. Do you mind not uh, saying where from? Because I'm from further north myself. Yeah, I grew up in Capistacy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm from a little town uh, called Vermilion Bay. I don't know if you've ever heard of Kenora. Kenora. Yeah. Yeah. It's about an hour uh, east of Kenora. There. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with Vermilion Bay. Yeah. But uh talking about living up north you got to be aware like you said of the climate and we have a really short growing season so I guess that's where we could tie in uh getting that dome like we did there have you guys uh have have you guys uh got a greenhouse or do you plan on getting one or uh we um so being in, in the city um we we're kind of sort of limited as to where we can put it um we're on a corner lot to kind of kick things off and our our front and one of our side yards is basically lined with the road, the driveway, the quote unquote mm -hmm. front yard. Um, so our backyard basically became where the garden was going to go. Uh, and initially, when we purchased the property, there was sheds there. We, we have a weird uh, elevation change in our backyard that we kind of scratched our head about what we're going to do with it. Do we level it out? Do we plateau it? Do we get a landscaper to come in and do something? All that costs like ridiculous amounts of money. So when we started out, uh, decided to expand from our small garden box. Um, initially, we're like, hey, we may be able to use a greenhouse. We may be able to do this. And we kind of mulled a couple of different options over. Um, and then cost became the deciding factor of, listen, I, I can go and get some two by sixes and frame in this, this garden, um, kind of like a modified keyhole design. And um, that's the, what we ended up doing. And then we just put some fresh dirt in there and. and we are thinking season. of doing a greenhouse so we put the pump in. It's just we can't get a grow dome there. That's the problem. We're gonna have to get property eventually. That's that's the goal. Ten acres at least, I'd say. Yeah, well, I've been following you guys for a few months and during the summer months I saw that you guys were had big harvest, like there was lots that you were growing in that small property, like you're saying. So yeah. it just goes to show, right? When he's talking about the elevation, though, we actually ended up using the elevation to our advantage because the slope where we did it, so our property, the way it, it ended up working, it, it ended up doing like a little like slope right at the end. So we cut into the slope. So when there was rainfall, it actually like slopes right into the rest of the garden. So we barely had to water over the whole entire summer or use our rain barrels because the elevation itself actually took care of 70 feet, I'd say the length was, because we did the whole corn section and that whole one area where you can see where I walk around the L, the very beginning of that stretch, that whole thing is sloped. So all the rain just goes right through it. It worked out. Most of our property is uh, clay and sand. 
Um, and I don't know, I don't know what the previous owners had in the backyard. There was like a, an elevated area and then it just dips into a drainage soil. Yeah. And so we kind of decided, Hey, if we, we just kind of dig into that, that and it worked. downhill. It slope. worked. We, even a pumpkin, we barely had to water our pumpkins this year, which was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Pumpkins had a lot of water. Yeah. So the, the corn, the drain, the, the corn, the, uh, the pumpkins, uh, the beans, um, I think onions, like a lot of the stuff that were right in that drainage swill, we barely had the water at all. Yeah, and that's uh, that's that's super smart there too. That's uh, utilizing the resources that are free, right? Like you had to do a little bit of work and have the right know-how to know that's like, oh, hey, I could take advantage of this. And then, because if you think you're living in the city too, right, you're on metered water. So every time you're running that hose in the back, you're spending more money. Before. <laughs> yeah. $500 water bill. <laughs> we, yeah. Yeah. we may or may not have accidentally um, not turned the hose off properly one time. Yeah. And um, my, my neighbor said, hey, uh, your hose was running. So I went to turn it off. I, I turned it off at the, the tap there. And I was like, oh, thanks. And I looked at where the hose was and it was like a giant pool. Oh. <laughs> well, how long has this been running? And we, we think it was probably running for an entire day. Uh, like full full board. So the, the lady at the city when she called me to because when they took the meter reading they went can you double check your numbers for me so I went and I gave her the numbers and she's like are you sure that's an eight <laughs> yeah that's an eight she goes you use that much like yeah we had a little incident with the bus yeah, so we have four rain barrels um but we got so much rain last year that we we didn't have we to didn't use even them. use the rain barrels to be quite honest we actually, yeah, we actually had too much rain for, yeah. for some of the stuff we we're trying to grow and it actually mm -hmm. swamped Our out. cucumbers didn't do well. The cucumbers are why we need green house. We really do. Um, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, sorry, go ahead. A lot of, it wasn't that much work. The big thing is getting the, the seedlings into the ground and starting your seeds and just being smart about it and knowing what goes where and why and letting it do its own thing but that was a that's a big big thing I like I highly recommend James Prigioni to everybody I meet because he's like he just teaches you how to use the plants to each other's advantage like it's almost like the people that say it's work don't realize how much it doesn't have to be work it's only as much work as you make it kind of thing, right it was a ton of work to start off. Uh, While well, you guys have been, been following the account, to build so, it, yes. Like you guys yeah. saw the progression. Yeah. And um, but it was one of those situations where I would have preferred the use of equipment. Um, yeah. Instead we did of it doing, with our bare hands. we we basically <laughs> ripped that up with our bare hands and a very dangerous tiller from 1939. Um, <laughs> So I learned my lesson there. I, the tiller is, is next on our, our big item purchase list if we're going to be keeping doing this. Um, but we um, we just got all our lumber, all our wood from a family member's property who just had some acreage and said, hey, you know what? We got a bunch of dead standing stuff. Come take them. So that's what we did. And all our, our garden beds uh, for last year's garden were all built out of what, whatever I could harvest from, from his, his property there. Um, so when you mentioned free, uh, it's, it's as close as free as you can get. And you know, we, we got really, I, I'm impressed by the results we got for the work that we had to put in. Yeah. Well, and it's, uh, it's like, I love hearing that when people get started. And I like hearing when uh, people say start out not knowing much. And then as you kind of get going, you start learning stuff. Because like for me, a step I get stuck on or had been stuck on for a long time was like, well, how do I do this right? And how do I do this right? And I was really worried about doing it perfect. And I had to just be willing to, all right, I'm going to kill a couple of plants. All right, I'm going to do some stuff wrong and whatever. And I'm going to look like an ass. But then you start doing it a little bit more. And like you said, you can learn more about it, plant it all together. Take, uh, you got rain barrels and use all the resources. It's like sometimes I think uh, the biggest problem that we have is we're not aware of resources and how to use them properly, right? There's rain falls out of the sky most of the year and you need to water your garden. It's like, well, how about we figure out a way to store as much as this as possible and then I don't have to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got the sun does the rest of the work for you and turns uh, the air and the soil into edible food. 
Like we're so tricked by the people that make it seem like it's more work than it actually is. And I think people get discouraged because they think that they need to buy this and that and the other thing just to have a healthy plant. And then if something dies on them, they think that they're failures. They don't realize how much more there is to it. And the more people experiment and the more people try other things, the better we're all going to get because things, things change, things adapt. So like what he does, James Prigioni, I was talking about, he does like experimental gardening where he'll try different things. And I like doing that as well. Like, I think the last one he did, he actually buried a dead fish, believe it or not, underneath a tomato plant to get that calcium and the nitrate. Like, he was actually testing that method. And I think it's important for us to all try different things like that because even just our where we are, like, it might work in Sudbury versus Toronto. You never know, right? Like, it's important to always be learning and trying new things to get these better plants. Yeah, and it's like, you know, and especially once you start doing stuff and you start understanding the basic kind of mechanics of what it is you're doing, yeah. you can start to play and experiment with like that. And then and then you're doing something cool too because you're like, oh, this is kind of a weird idea. Let's try it out. And then you're yeah. like, oh, hey, well, now that's, I don't know, it's just, it's, it seems fun. It's almost like you're, uh, like you said, you're experimenting. You're, you're uh, I don't know, I think the, the idea is really get doing something, right? And like you said, you got to kind of be uh, bold enough or maybe uh, stupid enough to really just say, oh, well, you know what? You guys are all wrong. I think I can do it. And start yeah. trying and find out for yourself. And trying new things. And if it doesn't work, well, try something else. And if that works, great. You found another way for people in your area to grow something. Like, yeah. you know, no matter what, you win no matter what. With this. Yeah. And I mean, like... Uh, you got time to do it and like it's uh if, if you could have like that much food in your own backyard just think mm -hmm. about like how much of a better utilization that is of the yard it's like you could have a, a lawn or you could have a bunch of plants that are bees are coming and getting pollen from you could you know uh feed your family healthy food if you get enough you could even bring some over and feed uh, your extended family maybe your neighbors uh mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, it's just a cool thing to <laughs> sort of talk about and do because like you're, you're uh, growing, like you're taking care of life, you're creating life in your backyard. And it's yeah. just, uh, it's, it's, it, so it's a kind of a thing that gives you life when you do it almost. Yeah, especially in the city. I love doing it in the city because then people that have the excuse that they don't do it in the city don't have it anymore because I'm doing it in my front lawn. Like we yeah. grew zucchinis and cabbage in our front lawn this year. and we strategically placed them behind dahlias and it worked. We had a massive cabbage. It was bigger than my head. <laughs> yeah, it was the size of basketball. Um, we had six zucchinis off the one plant in the front too, and it was watered twice. I actually kept an eye on that one. Um, what else did we get? I, we, we had first time girls for like a lot of different types of pumpkins. Um, mm -hmm. We tried different kind of squash, and we learned on that this year because our squash. We had a lot of cross pollination. We, cross pollination was the key word for the season in our, our squash department. Um, they were edible. They're really good. Um, we still have I don't know six or seven of them. Um, so it, it, it's a, like you said, it's a learning experience. You okay? So next year we're going to put the winter squash over here. We're going to put the summer squash over here. You know. Um, it's cute to, to grow everything on the pergola because it fills it up really nice and you know it just gives it this really neat garden look to it but at the same point at the same time as you want to try to eliminate the cross-pollination and have you know the, the, the stuff that you planted um but i, I yeah like for for us the, the the big thing was it was easy like it wasn't easy to create it was hard work but once we got done Everything was, you know, you put in the seeds and in our case, we start a lot of stuff in the house. Um, yeah. And then when the time came and we started moving stuff outside, it wasn't that much work. And even our neighbors come out and was like, oh my God, like you guys, what do you guys do? Like you guys spend your days in the garden. We're like, no, we go in the morning. We just double check, make sure we didn't have any critters, make sure you know, nothing's been taken apart by the, the local wildlife. Um, and then we both go our separate ways to work and then we come back and then, you know, 
if it needs water in the evening, we water in the evening. If it doesn't because it's rain today, we're not going to touch it. It's it's not as complicated as it's a lot of people really make not. it seem to. It's not at all. And that's where I, I almost get angry at the thought because I think of how much people are missing out, even the opportunity for nutrition in itself. Because I heard somewhere that the stuff in the grocery store only holds its nutritional value for 36 hours after it's been picked. I don't think the stuff in the grocery store is all under 36 hours off the line. So yeah. we noticed a huge difference in our health as well, eating off the plants. And we also found we weren't eating as much because we seemed to feel fuller. I don't know if you guys noticed that too, mm -hmm. but when you're eating off the vine, you seem to feel fuller, but you feel healthier as well. My thyroid used to be a really big problem and it has not been a problem. It's been perfect since I started eating out of the garden. Well, um, another thing that we've been doing too, because uh, we haven't been as successful with our gardening portion yet, but we've been trying to source locally our meat. And mm -hmm. the, the, the difference between like a chicken that's re like free range and does chicken things all the time, like the, the actual meat is totally different. It's meatier kind of like, it feels more like fiber to it. Like it, it feels mm -hmm. like, um, and like you said, you, you get a little bit more full from it. Maybe that's because there's, there's something more to that animal because he's doing what that animal is meant to be doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, yeah. We have a friend that has a, a little mini homestead slash farm. Uh, so she does the chickens and a few other animals. She she kind of just said exactly what you how you explained it is. It, it tastes like you can get chicken breasts from the store, or you can process your chicken, and the the meat looks different, the like different texture, and it actually tastes different when it's cooked in the same way. Um, so we're we're, we're stuck. We're stuck in town here because we can't have the chickens. And we, we mauled over the quail. Um, and then our intended area where we were going to keep them was transformed into something else. So we're, we're kind of banking on maybe hopefully someday soon uh, that we can uh, take this and move, ten plus it, acres. move it on a 10 plus somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We think the same thing too. Like, uh, we we the thing is is like the location where we happen to be right now like we're so close to family and stuff like it's it's kind of one of those perfect places but when like our life starts looking more like we want to be say being more sustainable for ourselves it's like well you know how realistic is that here uh then we start exploring ideas of like you know well you know what kind of sort, sort of small loops could we create too and like that's where i start thinking about talking to people locally who are doing what we're doing and showing the exact example of being able to grow food when you want to grow it, where you want to grow it. Yeah. And, um, and then also like say trying to buy local and stuff like that. Cause the way I also see it is um, my dollar that I went and earned, right. I can go give that to a big company that doesn't take care of their animals and doesn't care about me, or I can find someone who lives in my community and I can go and give them my hard earned money and they can give me their hard earned work and that animal that they took care of and cared about. And I can use that to feed my family. And it's like, well, what's your money worth really? Right. And like, maybe that's a sentimental value, but I know maybe that's worth something, right? It is. Like, that's the other thing that we're not really talking about is like the appreciation and the gratitude that comes into things too, because we take everything to grant it so much now, especially with it just being readily available that we noticed with our children, especially, it was big because they knew like that we have a rule that if you grow it and you pick it, you're eating it. So anything that's been grown in this house, they eat it. They, they don't like vegetables, some vegetables, but they know if they've taken care of it and it's came off that vine that they're gonna eat it because they appreciate that plant. Yeah. So we grew a lot of snap peas. So we had like over a hundred plants of snap peas throughout the whole entire backyard because they're the companion plant to everything. And her son would literally go and run down from his playhouse and just go pick peas as a snack. And we were like, okay, like why not, right? So it's, yeah. they appreciate that food because of what they do for it too. So we noticed that's a big thing with the kids and it, it's kind of a no brainer for other parents to just jump on this now. Cause like I said, we're in the city. There's no excuse not to do it. <laughs> Well, one thing that I noticed too during the summer um, was we would find ourselves and all of us 
uh, just snacking in the garden during the day. Like we're, mm -hmm. we're out there doing something and the kids are playing. And cherry tomatoes. It's like, oh yeah, we'll just walk up, grab a handful of cherry tomatoes or a handful of peas or beans or, you know, the pull out a couple of carrots. And um, uh, I find that now that that's- Ground not, cherries. Yeah, oh, the kids ground cherries. The ground oh, cherries. Love those things. The, um, the big thing I'm noticing now though is the, the snow on the ground in the garden not being alive. Um, that the kids are reaching for the sugary snacks. And we, we see a difference in their, in their behaviors, um, just being kind of cooped up. You know, Even to... the lettuce, like we had, we called it the salad bar. So our, and that, that salad bar, I don't know if you saw it at the beginning of the, the videos that I have, but the salad bar was the original garden that we had. But the salad bar feeds us the butter crunch, the early curl and the romaine throughout from June to like August. So you just keep picking and it'll just keep growing. Mm -hmm. So the kids all love taking turns where they take the little salad bin and they go down and they pick the salad. So you, you kind of make it into a hobby for them. And if it's not hard to do, it's just, it's fun. It's mm -hmm. literally fun as long as you're not discouraged by somebody telling you that it's so much work that it's not. <laughs> That makes me think too, like uh, you might hear people say like, you know, people are really malleable, you know, you can kind of shape people to do what you want. And then you start thinking, well, if I'm not consciously shaping my life, you know, who is? And when you're doing something like that, like you said, you're making it a habit or you're making it fun or whatever, you're mm -hmm. sort of instilling in your kids there, they're going to say, oh, like, you know, when I was growing up, it was so much fun. We grew our own food and, you know, we, it was awesome in the summertime. We would eat it all the time and it tasted so good. And, you know, mm -hmm. I noticed when I go to the store, doesn't really quite taste as good or I don't know it's just I like hanging out at the garden with my family so you know and then now they have that value and they're going to go out and and give that out to everyone they know or see just by virtue of of, of living that yeah. it's like that's uh it's it I don't know I, it's uh it's it's just a, a really good thing it makes me so happy when we talk to people who have a, a similar idea and and mm -hmm. are, are really living it because it's but well, it, it kind of gives me fuel in a way like it kind of inspires me well, one thing I, I've been reading and I follow a few people uh, who are into this is the uh, the crop sharing. Um, yeah. You know, like you mentioned, you're going to, you know, you buy your meat locally and stuff. Um, I, I've been following uh, a group of people that really, I mean, maybe 50 families. Um, and what they do is, so this, this family is going to grow their garden and they're going to have lots of peas and they're going to have lots of carrots and then the next family, they, they, you know, they'll grow something else, but they don't have peas and carrots. Um, and they're like, hey, you know, we'll give you these if you give us those. And then that that trade gets into the meat stuff, too. And I've seen a lot, uh, a lot of folks doing that. Um, you know, where, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this and I'll buy half a cow off of you uh, through the, that exchange. Um, I mean, it's really, really popular in Europe. Uh, that's the family that I follow is in Europe. And... Um, I mean, it works. It, they're saying they're they're not they're not 100 self sustained yet, uh, but there's there's some things that um, just isn't possible for them. But that's what I'd like to end up doing is hey, you know, I'm not crazy about raising cattle, but yeah, I don't you know, know if we'd have the heart to do livestock, but we see like how important it would be to have it. You know? Yeah, if I if I can grow a large field of something that somebody else needs that has cattle, it's like, hey, buddy, let's let's work out something here. Um, and I think that's kind of like the key way because you can't do everything on on one property um, as much as we well, we'd like to try. I mean, you, you could, but it's it, it at that point I feel like it almost becomes a full time occupation. Um, you know, I, I used to do inspections in in the farming sector, and um, I find a lot of people were, were basically all communicating the same was it's it's a great thing to do to support yourself to save money uh, this and that but a lot of people that are doing it are doing it more like on a commercial basis to get that money to be able to afford the stuff that they can't produce on their property mm -hmm. so you know and to, for us to, to kind of bridge that gap uh, by using like I said local sources uh, I think that's kind of a sort of where I would like to be in, you know, next five years, I would yeah. like to establish something like that. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been thinking along the same sort of lines there lately too. Um, that idea of sort of crop sharing or, or figuring out a sort of mutual exchange program with people, right? It's mm -hmm. like, there's no reason why, you know, people can't do exactly that. And like you said, 
you know, I can't take do this thing over here, but you can, and I can provide value to you. So we're both getting more out of this. And, you know, say in that situation, they had 50 people in Europe, you could actively work to make something like that here, say, and we could maybe get, get the guy involved who's doing cattle and say like, Hey, you know, how much do you think you'll need of this or whatever? And it might be one of those things too, where it's like, you know, uh, certain loops are only so big, but like once maybe you understand the template, you're like, Hey, maybe we can get another group of people doing something like this. Like maybe like, you know, the scale is a limiting factor, but maybe like you said, it could, uh, cut the costs or do enough help to really, because the way I see it, you're getting two things too. You're also getting people who are doing something that's uh, valuable to the community. And mm -hmm. if they're doing it on a semi-commercial basis, earning money for their family, and you're creating food right here in the area. So like, let's say, you know, God forbid something happens where transports can't get to the store and they can't get food there. Well, you're like, well, the guy who makes my food lives in such and such a place and uh, my freezer is already full because that's the other advantage to say when you're buying locally for meat, you got to think ahead of time because there's a certain time to harvest the animal, right? Mm -hmm. So like right now, if I go look in my freezer, I got months worth of food so i mean like you know i'm not i'm not really worried if that doesn't happen but that's that's all it's it's a whole different kind of lifestyle right yeah yeah, it, yeah so that's the thing too is, is how do you you know uh where what resources do you go to to store your crops uh so that you have carrots over winter so that you have potatoes over so that's all stuff that we're we're slowly kind of picking away at uh, you know, like root cellar stuff. I, <laughs> I, I've seen just those handmade underground, they, they call them ground fridges. Yeah. You know, and you just do sand. They they go, use, yeah, they sand, sand, sand and cinder yeah. blocks and just bury those, you know, four or five feet in the ground and you store your stuff in there and it's, it's, it's no different than the old root cellars in the old days. It's just, you know, a little bit that's more what it is. We need we need to bring the old days back, but adapt it to modern advances that don't yeah. hurt the environment. That's what it all comes down to. We need anything that we affect the environment on, we need to have some sort of benefit towards. And then we need to basically continue to adapt and become modern farmers, I guess, or what you could call it. Yeah, and the cool thing about that is 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 it kind of ends up giving people way more agency in their own life, right? Like you're not dependent on some sort of overarching structure to take care of you because you're actively participating, not only in taking care of you, your family, but your community. Yep. And because of that, you can rely on those people because you rely on them every day and they rely on you every day and you can put a face to what's going on in this interaction. <laughs> and I think especially these last couple of years, if there was ever a kick in the pants to realize sort of where we're going when it comes to staring at phones all the time and staying at home it's like you only get one shot at the bucket here and uh wouldn't you like to spend it around people that's kind of what makes the whole thing worthwhile and so i i, I kind of see that with uh i think i think you have the same mindset as me when it's when it's like you know that's that's the way to start going that's a sustainable future yeah i love knowing what's in my food and i love knowing that like we know the process from literally the worm castings right to the point where we're recycling and collecting those seeds from that plant that we're sitting down and eating like having not just like you're not just an influence but actually seeing the whole process like thoroughly to that it's like it's it's amazing right it's nature's magic it's what it comes down to and i think that the more we try to replicate it, the more problems we cause. So I, I really believe in like the sustainability and trying to to retain what we have versus trying to modify it. If that makes any sense. Yeah, and like to the degree that you're going to modify anything, like say in an instance like helping a plant grow up a certain way or whatever it is that you're doing, keeping it spaced away from other plants so it can thrive in the right way. It's like, be very careful what it is you're doing because every little bit you do does make a difference. So when you try to think like, say, oh, I, I wish this plant would be uh, produced way, way, way more than it does right now. It's like, well, okay, that's great. But what effect is that going to have on the ground, say? Yeah. And then, you know, how long are you going to be able to keep doing this? And so what's, what's the input to get this extra output, right? 
and how healthy is the fruit that you're getting off of it if you're pushing that plant too hard, right? Um, vertical planting too, that's another big thing. With, with city gardening in particular, anything you can plant vertically or get creative with, like just for space saving, it's, it's needed. So getting creative with the idea of taking branches and letting your peas trellis up them and everything else, that's important too. Um, with the city gardening. I forgot to mention that part. Yeah, that's uh, that's something we'll have to do a little more of this year. We got a little more of a structure for the garden. We learned a lot about when we where we planted our stuff and how we're going to plant it. I think this year we're going to utilize the dome for a lot of our stuff that was a little more, say, humidity sensitive because yeah. there was a period of time at the end of the year there where it seemed like we just couldn't get away from the rain and it just killed all anything that was like could have got powdery mildew, got it. And then it was just like a plague. And it was, it was so sad because you're trying to like do something to sort of stop it. And it's like, really the way you stop it is you got to have a little more control over the humidity if you can. And that's where I think we'll, we'll try to use the dome for more stuff like that. And, and because we, we planted stuff in the wrong place last year, this year we're going to plant stuff a lot differently. And like you said, using that vertical guard, uh, gardening, and uh, that's how you really kind of increase your yield with the little space that you got. We even managed to trellis pumpkins. Like it, you can do it. You you just have to, you have to not let people think that you're weird on it. You know, like you, yeah. you can't let that insecurity get to you because you will have the people looking at it and going, what the heck is she doing? But you just have to let it go because obviously if I had let that get to me, we wouldn't have had the pumpkin meal that we did. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not letting those people control the whole idea of gardening we need to like just be creative people and, and do what we need to do yeah when she mentioned oh yeah we'll trellis our pumpkins i was like yeah i was uh, I, I was doing uh, it i didn't care what anybody like, yeah I, I don't think that's gonna work <laughs> and then like we grew that uh that blue hubbard squash in our tunnel yeah. and it was like bigger than the basketball it was huge mm -hmm. And it, you could tell that it adapted to that growing Nature. condition. Nature the is stem, magic. Nature the stem is on magic. it ended up being about it just strengthened its whole, the whole stem part, and it connected the stem part onto the trellis. Yeah, that's it, what it yeah, does. So, like the plants will adapt. That's what I'm getting at. So you can't just assume because nobody's ever grown it that way that it's not going to be able to do it. It's the experimental planting, right? And yeah, there's it's not fun, one way. Especially for the kids to see. Yeah, so your, your little kids are walking through this tunnel and they've got pumpkins growing above their heads, like <laughs> yeah. creating magic in your backyard. Like there's literally no excuse not to. So. Yeah, and it's, that's, uh, it's, it kind of makes me think of like, it's like a just kind of dream it and do it almost kind of thing. It's like, oh, you can grow pumpkins up in the air. It, it almost sounds like something a little kid would say. It's like, oh yeah, we got pumpkins that grow up in our pumpkin tree. It's like tree, yeah. pumpkins are not trees. It's like, well, at my house, they are. So what we decided this year, I think we have two uh, two trees in our front yard. Um, yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to clear the ground around it and uh, just put a dirt mound there um, and just grow some some of our birdhouse or gourds up in there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we're going to try different things and it's it's fun it's fun it's, it's different. literally fun it's just people are walking down the street to. and they're like well, what do you have growing in there oh come on over and see you know there's there's yeah. my giant this and there's my zucchini that's almost three feet long and you know but there's some stuff we did for fun like obviously we, you know that you know if you cut your zucchini when they're eight inches you'll get a much better yield but um yeah we had a almost a three foot long zucchini wow <laughs> yeah yeah, some of that stuff, yeah, you just grow it to see how, how far you can push it just for, like you said, like a hobby, like fun. And I think the other way that it pushes me, I, I grew up, yeah, I know, I grew up in kitchens, uh, working in restaurants and stuff, and I always enjoy being in the kitchen, cooking, just coming up with recipes, coming up with stuff. And then it kind of forced me to think, okay, you know, we have squash, we have zucchini, we have this, what are we, what are we going to do? And there's stuff that I never even thought of. I just Google like, hey, well, I got this giant squash. What do I do? Oh, zucchini lasagna. Oh, let's try that. You know, that's what we did. We did zucchini lasagna. We did a whole bunch of different recipes, the pan patty squash. Um, and it, it was, I'd rather eat from my garden than go to a restaurant. And people think I'm crazy when I say that, but 
it is what it is. I you appreciate it, and it tastes so much different because you put it all in there. Yeah. Even yeah. our four year old is already bugging us to start the gourds in the window because I normally start the birdhouse gourds right in the window around now, actually, because they they take a long time to grow. So he's already bugging us to get the plants growing because he's remembering from the last two years. So allow like making it fun and making it not work is I think the key because if it doesn't feel like work you can't make people make you think it's work because it's not yeah and like you said too about going to the restaurant if you think about it there's some restaurants that really like to focus on artisanal foods right like they're going to have a craft locally sourced beer they're going to have a locally sourced animal and locally sourced vegetable so if you're going to a really quality restaurant where you're dropping a pretty penny on you actually are, in fact, eating something that's probably equivalent quality, especially if you have any know-how, know-all at all, at all in the kitchen. So yep. that, and like you said too, you got to kind of think about what you're harvesting and stuff. So, um, so was there like a sort of staple that you kind of found while you were doing that? That was like an easy go-to. So, like, would you sort of have regularity to what you would have, like, say, the same thing once every week or lettuce? Every, yeah, almost every night we had a salad. Yeah, like I was trying to pawn our, our lettuce off to my neighbors and uh, the zucchinis, um, the same thing. I'd be like, hey guys, if you guys want want to make a, a salad for supper, just just crawl over the fence and, and just, here's the scissors, just clip yourself some lettuce. Um, you want carrots, you want, you know, just, this is where these are. If you want these, just go get these or just ask me and I'll give them to you. We have way too many. Um, we got to up our canning game. Um, we did salsa with our thousands and thousands of tomatoes. Um, we had so many tomatoes. We, we actually lost so many tomatoes. The white Thomas salsa. Um, we, how, how I kind of was working it was, okay, well, what's, what's getting ready? Well, what's, what am I going to be able to pluck out of the garden to make food with? And when we did our groceries, we kind of went around that so, okay so we'll we'll do this recipe we'll do that recipe we'll do that recipe and that's basically how we went about or how i went about to do it for, for meal planning and all that stuff and it worked out pretty good but yeah like our staples were definitely the zucchini we had so many zucchinis um and then the uh the lettuce uh the mm -hmm. peas the tomatoes um and like i said we need to up our game for canning so that i i mean i've been watching some videos and I'm like, oh man, that's what I want. You know, when there's, you know, a 20 foot long shelf, this four jars wide of just about everything in your garden. If we would have done that, um, I mean, salsa wise, I think we still have about like four or five jars left. Um, pickles, you know, all that kind of stuff. We, there's so many things we want to try, but it's it, little by little, like we went with the low money approach um, and I, I'm very satisfied with how it turned out. Um, so next year, maybe we'll throw a little bit of money at it, and, you know, upgrade our stuff, upgrade our canning stuff. Um, you know, the goal is to be able to just I, yeah, have I stuff for the, the, the entire year. Oh, yeah, the strawberries. So the strawberries, we bought them this year, but with the, with them, they, they, they come up more the next year, right? So we bought 25 of them, and then I pinched off the flowers, and we ended up, I think we counted like 70 plants by the end of the summer, wow. because they rooted so much. Wow. They had actually rooted so much that they had left the bed that we had planted them in, and took over the begonia <laughs> the planter in front of it. So I've got like a whole planter of strawberries now to give to people, because mm. I have no idea what to do with them. And we had some stuff uh, escape our garden and end up on our neighbor's We had a pumpkin leaf and it went to the neighbor's house, like through the fence. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, it's better that you have a plant growing over on your neighbor's lawn and leaving a pumpkin over there than your dog going over and leaving something else. Exactly. It was funny. Yeah. Yeah. We, one thing I was really surprised of was where we are. We've had a lot of bear issues, um, yeah. you know, middle of the night kind of stuff. And I was really concerned about, hey, look, we're basically growing a buffet. A grocery store for for, for local wildlife. And um, I mean, we lost a little bit of corn to birds and squirrels. Um, maybe a little bit of the strawberries that, that did grow come out. But for like taking a whole look back at everything, we, we barely had any loss of the wildlife. Um, well, and that, so that's another trick is marigolds. Marigolds are a huge one for pest deterrence. 
And we, uh, we've got the big cracker jacks, which are like three feet tall. So I'm kind of wondering, did that keep the bear from, they, they don't like the smell of it. Like oh, okay. So little critters like squirrels and all, they hate the smell of marigold. So I kind of wonder, did that have possibly an influence there? But I'm sure it would. I'm not going to not plant them anymore because we've got like hundreds and hundreds of seeds, but yeah. That was that was another first year bunny fail. We accidentally planted the Cracker Jack marigolds into the, the main garden, not knowing they were three foot tall marigold plants. Oh. <laughs> so they grew into giants in the garden there. Yeah. So we had these plants in there for pest deterrence and we physically couldn't get around the plant that was supposed to be the pest deterrent to get to the actual, so it basically kept us out too. We ended up having to pull it like four of them because we couldn't get to our actual plants. It was funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's something that we'd like to look into a little bit more too. The marigolds I had he heard of. There was one you planted next to the cabbage. Uh, I forgot the name now, but I heard it before. Kalinda or something like that? The sternum? Is that how you so pronounce it? Sternum maybe. Sternum maybe. Yeah. They like it. Um, what else was there? There's another one too. I forget. There's quite a few different flowers that you can use as companions to literally attract the bugs away from the actual plant themselves. Yeah. Kind of neat. Um, yeah, the marigolds are a big one. Like, I love the marigolds out there. And they're not a bad looking flower either. No. Like, we had them in the front, and people were like, oh, what are those? They're just big, bright, yellow, orange flowers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see them from at the corner basically when you're walking up so um yeah no we had we had neighbors kind of come up to us and go oh what are you doing how are you doing it and i never thought we could do this and I was, well, heck yeah, you could do this. so you could grow these in flower pots on your deck if you want so mm -hmm. we, had, we had a couple neighbors interested and in, uh, i think a couple doors down there yeah said, i'm doing a sunflower field that has no sense here yeah. we've got a neighbor down the street that's actually going to kind of join us in the whole you know getting his garden going and he's going to have I think he wants a perimeter of sunflowers in his yeah. front lawn and we're in New Sudbury, so yeah. Well, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's kind of like a little bit of a change of mind too, in a way where you're used to seeing like just a front lawn and you'll have a certain kind of flower expected in there. It's like, well, let's try these other flowers. They're kind of, uh, they, they thrive in this area and they're really good for this. <clears throat> and it's like, well, usually you don't grow, say, squash in the front yard, but it's like, well, maybe we start growing squash in the front yard and people don't think it's so weird to grow squash in your front yard. And, you know, what, what's, what's really the use of the lawn? It's kind of, it's almost like kind of a flex in a way. You're saying, I got this land here that I'm not using to grow food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pretty much. So the, you guys keep an eye on that account because we're going to be doing some pretty out there stuff with well, and the dahlias stuff are, this year. so I took my dahlias and I because I was a little worried about neighbors saying stuff and I took the bigger flower plants and strategically placed them around like the bigger veggies in the front lawn because they don't it's none of their business what's behind that flower like yeah. <laughs> they just yeah. need to care about the flower right so we, we grew pumpkin in the front lawn yeah, we grew a pumpkin in the front yard. Actually, that one I tested from the superstore. We got the seed, like the pumpkin, the year before at the superstore, and I collected the seed and we grew it. I think he was, it was 12 pounds. Yeah, it was a big pumpkin. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, people, people, like you can get pumpkins in the store, and people are like, Where'd you get all your pumpkins? So, uh, right here. Grocery store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah, we just grew them. They're like, are you serious? You grew that here? Like, yeah. Like, you've seen the pictures of the, all the pumpkins on the yeah. front step. And people were just like, how did you get all those pumpkins? We just grew them. And people, that, I think that kind of made a few people it realize. Makes, it makes me sad. It makes me honestly sad because I, I know how much fun I have growing it. And I know how much people are like, oh, it's amazing. But I'm like, just stick it in the ground. Just do it please you know yeah, you can yeah exactly it, you can do it in town you can do it from an apartment if you've got a balcony just try you know yeah it's, i'm not i'm not any we're not anything special we just we we didn't care about the opinion to give it a go and that's what we did and we have no regrets so yeah well yeah maybe maybe we're no one special or everyone's a little more special than they thought and they just need to start kind of believing in themselves a little bit. 
it, it just that's what it just irritates me because I'm like really we can all do this we just for some reason have it in our brains that we can't and it's it's not as complicated we just need to remember how to do it basically well it sounds like you guys made a few th- people kind of shift their perspective on things and hopefully you know little by little people start thinking of it differently and mm-hmm. you know it won't be so weird to have a big fr- food forest in your front lawn yeah. or not have a lawn but have it in your front yard right yeah yeah and and uh I know we're going to keep uh keep an eye on your page there and uh I mean talking to you guys like I said um, I'm glad I talked to you guys tonight because uh it made me really happy to hear you guys were doing the same thing we're doing and and succeeding at it and because we were we were starting to look at like you know when when's the time to start getting ready to start planting we start the people were following and stuff like that they're like oh just got some seeds or I got my seeds and they're starting to say oh putting stuff in the windowsill and then now talking to you guys like oh okay it's almost time to get start get going again and it's kind of fun to think oh yeah, we're going to go check up on, on their plants there and see how they're doing and, and, and that kind of thing, especially now talking like this and everything. Yeah, we managed to grow peas in our bedroom window uh, before, that was actually really fun. before the plants actually made it outside. Peas uh, have very, very thin roots, so they don't need that much soil, right? So they're, mm-hmm. so, they're just resilient little buggers. <laughs> <laughs> we just set some strings across our window and they just trellised all the way up and was like, oh, what's that? Is that a pea? Oh my God, we have a pea. We're growing peas in the house. And it's not even a south facing window, but it gets a lot of sun. Yeah. yeah. The red wigglers would probably do amazing in that dome. Well, that's, uh, that's definitely something I think we got to look into because uh, it sounds like a better way to do the composting, really. It sounds like a little more active where I imagine because you're putting stuff in there every week, they're, they're making a lot free every week. And I imagine yeah. if you got, say, a lot of food in the house, lots of clippings or whatever, they'll probably propagate and grow to match the input you're putting in there. Yeah. So just for an idea, the bags that we got were like basically the size of a small kid's football. So that okay. was a pack each. So we got two of those. Um, when I, we started with one bin and I opened it up and like, hey, like this is a lot of castings. We have to start separating them. And I wasn't set up to do that properly. So what I did is I just kind of split the bin in half. So now we have the two bins and now both of them are getting pretty full. So I'm probably going to have to start a third bin before middle of February uh, just to keep them going. Uh, so they, they multiply so much. And I mean, I, I've had worms crawling right now. Our bins right in our garage. Dome, though, like they could probably just put them yeah. right into the bin. I'm not even kidding. Like you, it'll try. Because yeah, the people that I've I've, I've looked at and, and watched the videos and read the uh, the articles on for for the worms, they they kind of stick around where the food sources are. So if you yeah. do dump them in a garden, they, they will come come back and and feed on on what's there. Well, they so they, they put a coffee can like a full even just a plastic folders can and stick your compost in that and right into the ground and they'll come to the. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> just drill bowls in the bottom and like uh, those big ice cream containers or the Folgers plastic coffee cans, anything like that. So a lot of people are using. So we might, now that we have more than what we started with the worms, I think we might give that a shot this year and see what happens. Yeah, well, that's definitely something I think we're going to probably try to look into because that uh, makes a whole lot of sense. And like you said, it's a good source of fertilizer for the plants and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're, uh, we're, we're about at the time here where we're going to start wrapping it up. So if uh, you guys want to kind of like say uh, where you could be reached or, or what, uh, what could be seen on your page or uh, with regards to stuff like that. So uh, our page on Instagram is uh, Sudbury City Gardeners. And uh, that's pretty much where we, we upload all our little fun stuff and uh, our progress, our failures, and uh, some of our or a little my weird experiment yeah the experiment like that i'm doing the fish this year i'm 100 percent trying that fish <laughs> we're, we're looking <laughs> forward to seeing how it goes yeah we'll watch it so uh thank you guys very much for uh taking the time to talk to us and uh we look forward to seeing how your uh how it keeps going there it's a pleasure meeting both of you all right thanks so much thank you have a good night bye